Uh, it has started basically in October 2022 uh, with the paper that our Garner Galassian, uh, co-authoring with Doug Luxton and David Archer, actually had published. The first view about how uh, the central, uh, how can a central bank uh, in practice, uh, in a systemat systematic way, do the risk management approach to the monetary policy and introduce the framework and the key aspects of, that, of those framework. After basically the publication of the paper and the discussion uh, and the talk that the government gave at the, at the IMF, uh, we were continuously working over the course of this, uh, this one year and a half. Uh, getting feedback from from different experts, from different uh, economists and uh, policymakers of all over the world, including uh, Laurie Summers, Charles Goodhart, Bob Ford, actually, who is uh, with us here to discuss the topic, and many others. Uh, basically, getting the feedback about the different aspects of the framework. And uh, finally, in January of this year, we have uh, in a symposium here, we have officially launched the framework. And then in March of this year, uh, during our first uh, monetary, full monetary policy round of this year, we have published the first ever monetary policy report. The first point I would make uh, regarding training and so on is it's a lot easier to train people now when you have something functioning than when you're in the process of building it and collecting feedback and, and so on. Uh, the other thing that was interesting that's related to the, um, the issue of both the Bank of England uh, is that we have the advantage that we're much smaller, okay? That these kinds of issues are, I think, much more difficult when you have large institutions and history in a specific history, it's it's kind of hard to it's even more difficult to change things when you have more people involved in it and so on. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the dynamic learning environment. Okay, why do we have four six-person teams and so on? Um, and the analogy uh, that we're going to use is to, uh, uh, to volleyball. <laughs> volleyball is a really good one uh, uh, because in uh, volleyball, uh, the people have to play all six positions. Uh, sometimes they have to play defense. Sometimes they have to play offense. Sometimes their role is to set up the uh, other players to spike the ball and so on. So uh, the, the system that Hike has designed here and I always tell the students this, just imagine uh, that you might be the manager like Hike one day. How would you want it to look uh, like? Uh, and and I think that's what uh, leads us to uh, uh, four or six person teams, because uh, if you have a person, uh, you know, they get sick or something comes up, you always have a backup team or a backup person that can step in uh, very quickly to the role that's uh, being played. And you have two other teams that are basically working on developing their analytical skills or the, or the analytical framework to get ready uh, to enter uh, the game uh, uh, in the future and so on. So uh, why six people? Uh, it's very, very difficult to get more than six people to uh, to basically function and to communicate with each other. So I have a long history helping central banks uh, uh, develop these frameworks. You might even say I was responsible for some of the errors that were propagated um, in the sense that uh, my experience at the Bank of Canada for 13 years, which of course is a uh, you know, as a big central bank, uh, it was organized in a way where you had tons of resources. Uh, you had a bunch of people uh, doing uh, current analysis. Uh, that's where I started at the Bank of Canada. Uh, I rotated from cur one current analysis job to another current analysis job and bounced back uh, between those kinds of jobs and research uh, and so on. So I was constantly kind of moving from one job to the other and then eventually 
took over the coordination of the projection process and then eventually was put in charge of developing the framework in the late 1980s to support um, what we would call FPAS Mark I. But it was done with tons of people involved in the process and that problem uh, created massive coordination issues uh, and so on. So what are we doing? Uh, we're trying to create economists that can do it all. And so they need to do current analysis. Uh, they need to know how to build uh, the scenarios and do policy analysis. They need to be able to communicate with the board uh, and obviously write uh, great monetary policy re reports to communicate with the outside world. And they need to have a good grasp of uh, what we would describe as uh, modern uh, macroeconomics and so on. So I think that uh, that would be the, you know, some of the uh, key points uh, that I would make. Now, uh, it's it's interesting uh, because when I ask the uh, senior people uh, that have been involved in developing uh, FPAS Mark II, uh, I ask them uh, in light of these recommendations by Bernanke, is that if you had a lot more resources, how would you change it? Okay, and the answer is not much, actually. Uh, you'd still stick with uh, four or six person teams uh, because that's just efficiency. The quality and the standards of those teams would obviously improve because you would be able to attract talent because you had more uh, resources to uh, attract more talent. But but I think that's that sort of speaks to the efficiency of this dynamic learning environment where people are learning from each other. There's less of a, a hierarchy uh, where you're going and listening to somebody lecture, hoping to uh, uh, learn the truth about something and more critical thinking and more uh, learning something, internalizing it and, and, uh, and testing people. Now that we've developed uh, FPAS Mark II, uh, when we first developed FPAS Mark II at the Central Bank of Armenia, we used the United States as a laboratory because, you know, obviously it's a very data rich environment. We had the Atlanta Fed's GDP now and, and sticky price inflation. So there was a lot of things there that was current analysis and now casting up to what we consider to be the best of the best uh, types of uh, standards. So, and in addition to that, because many of the issues are sensitive, it's hard to develop a framework and do policy at the same time. It's much easier to discuss the ideas and to test the ideas working on uh, the United States. Now that we've done that, now the students are, are applying the FPAS Mark II ideas to other uh, country cases. So we have uh, examples where uh, uh, Sergei uh, is working on applying it to the United Kingdom. Uh, Anna uh, is working on, I think, uh, uh, what what country is Anna? Czech Republic, okay, an FPAS uh, Mark I uh, central bank. Miriam's working on New Zealand. Uh, uh, Annie's working on Brazil. Uh, so, and, and the idea that by applying Mark II to different country experiences, uh, they learn more from each other uh, than basically just focusing on on one model and one uh, particular country. Uh, in terms of the technology uh, that we use, um, so one of the latest things that we're into, Deanna's on the screen right now, and, and her and Svetlana are in charge of standards uh, for things like charts. And so we're in the process of uh, developing a website at the Global Forecasting School where the students will be able to uh, share information about things like standards and charts and so on uh, 
This is all being built off of some software. It's the only software that we'll be using that isn't open source, uh, but it's free to people um, as long as they're not using it for commercial purposes, in which case uh, it's priced fairly reasonably. Now, what does high charts do? It does everything. So most of the, you know, the high, the great graphics in economics uh, that you see uh, in things like Fred and places like that, uh, chances are that it's driven by by high charts. What is high charts? Well, uh, it's something that's malleable. Uh, what we're going to be using it is creating an editor uh, that allows us that allows the economy the economist to uh, pick a particular type of chart uh, that would be up to what our standards are, and they uh, then fill out some fields that would fill out the title and the subtitles and uh, the colors of the graphs, the lines and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's that's high charts. But but our editor will do a lot more than that uh, in the sense that uh, it will also run a front end uh, that will allow people to create scenarios with our core projection models. Uh, so the first one will be the quarterly uh, projection model, which comes in two varieties. One is called endocred, uh, which is a non-linear model. Uh, what we refer to as a mixed complementarity problem, where we think of policy as being an optimal control problem. Uh, so we use quadratic objective functions. In the case of the United States, it's an asymmetric uh, quadratic objective function because they don't seem to care about excess demand. They only care about uh, full employment, uh, maximum employment, and not, and they don't seem to be too concerned about uh, overheating. So quadratic ejective function that can be asymmetric, and then a system of linear and nonlinear equations. The nonlinear equations include things like endogenous policy credibility that includes the basic insight that if you allow long-term inflation expectations to ratchet up or down, uh, that it can be very costly uh, to get uh, inflation and inflation expectations re-anchored and so on. It also includes a nonlinear Phillips curve, which of course was really important for thinking about COVID, uh, since when we think about uh, that nonlinear or convex Phillips curve, we think of it as being driven by the proportion of firms in the economy that are facing bottlenecks. So that ended up being perfect uh, during uh, COVID. And of course, uh, it includes uh, effective lower bound on interest rates, which which is an occasionally binding constraint and makes the problem uh, really interesting because you could potentially fall into the dark corner of a low inflation trap like the euro area or like the bank of japan or worse yet deflation like a fisherian deflation which is of course uh, even worse than what the bank of japan fell into the last uh, three decades and so on uh, and so uh so that's the model uh the model we think is uh we would describe it as a semi-structural model uh, where we embrace theory, but we don't uh, marry it. So it has some of the key principles that you would want to put into any monetary policy model for guarding against uh, the typical types of tar corners that central banks are concerned with. We also use a, a, a collection of uh, other tools, uh, our we use for basic econometrics, so like when we're estimating uh, single equations and things like that. So Miriam, uh, who's on the screen right now, is uh, is in the process of writing a working paper on the consumption function uh, that uses R uh, extensively. Now, the real workhorse uh, behind the website uh, is going to be Dynair Julia. It is going to be the thing on the back end. Uh, for people that know about uh, Julia, uh, it is as fast as compiled C code. And so it's just, you know, for the types of things that we're interested in, we 
which is solving this mixed complementarity problems and doing Bayesian estimation, it is extremely powerful. Uh, it is all ready to go, and we're already starting to put it into the back end applications and so on. So Dinar Julia for the back end. Uh, why only for the back end? Well, it's pretty clear that Python uh, is the program that everybody uh, needs to learn as a general multi-purpose program. So given that everybody's going to be learning uh, Python, you pretty well have to have Python being a really big part of the analysis. And so, and so we're thinking of uh, Python uh, either being helping to drive the front end or or being able to access anything that we do and compute in the system. These are just some uh, calculations of uh, some of the applications that we do. As I said, uh, we have two of them. Uh, the mixed complementarity problem, which is uh, just an optimal control problem where you have a nonlinear perfect foresight uh, problem. The analogy here would be the international uh, real business cycle model. Uh, and so you can just see the, the difference in performance uh, from Dynair Julia versus Dynair MATLAB is uh, is staggering in, in some cases. Uh, and then of course the other aspect, uh, which is the sister model to our nonlinear models. So every time we do a nonlinear model like Endocrad, we also uh, construct a linearized representation of that that we can then use full battery of, of techniques that have been developed in Dynair. Once the model is linear, then we can estimate it with Bayesian methods. We can do all kinds of things. Now, uh, the, the linear models that we have in mind, uh, we can also uh, think about generating impulse response functions that are very specific uh, to particular episodes. So we're trying to effectively try, we're trying to replicate the basic economic insights that are in our nonlinear models, but but allowing us to uh, to estimate them. But we're not estimating them to get, tell us what the answer is. Uh, we're asking the, estimating them and teaching the students uh, to be critical thinkers to, and to understand the problems associated with uh, linear models. Thank you.